and then I landed on the hospital. I was on coma. Um, I lost between here. I still have a hole here and a hole here. I lost six inches of my of my of my right thigh and my hip between on my hip all the way. They had to put in a, um, a 12 inch rod all the way. I have two screws here. I have two screws on my ankle. I had a skull fracture from here all the way to the middle of my head. That was a plan. I really wanted to have a show where women could express their views. You are lying to my daughter. Yeah, I just crawled under anything. My father has come and ran away and rushed into the car. Between the between the Isolo and Bagada, oh God, I got the preaching of my life. Do you know how many years they've been telling me Jesus Christ is coming? Do you know how many years Jesus Christ has been coming? He has not come. He is not coming. I said, yes, sir. Hello guys, welcome and my name is Shay Colley James. This is an exclusive interview with the queen of talk herself, Mrs. Moriah Afolabi Brown, who is becoming the queen of talk TV released on Amazon and in physical copies. So this is an exclusive and we have her in the studio here waiting to get into the nitty gritty of the book. Congratulations Ma on your view becoming 10 years. Uh, how, how do we start? How, can you remember your first episode on your view? Thank you very much for having me. Oh wow, that day we were all nervous because I was even sharing recently that even up until the show started, we hadn't decided on the name. We're still thinking this morning, uh, I think uh, the morning show or your view. I was insisting on your view. My team was saying, what does your view mean? What I said, I kept telling them it was based on an American concept called The View. Yeah. It does you understand. So the moment we're about to start the show, my producer kept saying, Ryan, are you sure you want to use your view? I said, yes. <laughs> the name of the show is your view and then we'll issue with the logo so uh, but yeah that was the idea on that first day we were very nervous because uh, we were discussing paper reviews and at the time nobody on that set had a clue what was happening in Nigerian politics governance social issues we had an idea but we just did not have the right perspective all right so um initially in the beginning we, we, we seemed kind of shallow to our viewers because we we're not very privy to um, social issues, politics. We had an idea of what we wanted to see, but we didn't have enough depth and knowledge on what has been happening in politics. So it took a while, you know, a year or two years, because we're just regular women, you know, the girl next door, and it took the former director of finance, director of um, radio, RDG, the lead RDG, that uh, worked on us to get us to the point where we're able to speak eloquently and express our views on the show. That's that's incredible. Coming from the fact that you grew up watching Ricky Lake and <laughs> other American shows, I mean, when did you decide that I want to do this? I want to be a talk show host. You know, I was in the U.S. when The View started, okay. and I was also in the U.S. when Oprah Winfrey became um, a household um, reference okay. for women emancipation. You know, okay, always the nice Oprah in the nineties. So it was where people started saying, "Okay." This is something I can express myself. I have a right. I am a woman. So I was I, I was forming my, my, my adolescence was formed in that society. So I knew that I wanted something like that when I come to Nigeria. So when I came to Nigeria, I had the dream of becoming Oprah and having a host talk talk hosting a talk talk show. It took a while, you know, it wasn't so the idea wasn't to create the view. But then um, I knew that I wanted to do something like, like the view. I also knew I wanted to have something like the Oprah show. But then, um, in my previous employments, I tried to start something like that. I will never forget my former boss, Tony Suber. We were starting a talk show in, in high TV. He said, yes, I want to be on TV. Please stay behind here. You producer, stay as a producer. He didn't believe I could do it. You know, but when I got hired in TVC, I told my interviewer, the former MD at the time, I said, sir, I have a TV show idea. I'd like to post a show. He said, sure, that's, that's a problem. You're the director, you're the director in charge of um, TV. You might as well do whatever you want to do. So, um, yes, that was the plan. I really wanted to have a show where women could express their views and be able to show that they are very, very interested in what's going on around them and their environment. Wow, that's very interesting. I mean, this is the first attempt. This is your first book. Yes, it is. Wow. What really inspired you and why now? Well, your view is 10 years. And okay. um, actually, I never thought of having a book. It was um, okay. Dr. Stephen McIntyre who came on our show. And he just says, why don't you write a book? I mean, I've seen people who write books, but it has never occurred to me that I had anything to say. I kept saying, I have nothing to say. What am I going to write a book about? But you have to write, you know, I'll interview you. 
and I ask you questions. From okay. there, we can then elicit various chapters based on your story, based on your experience. And it was from that interview with him that I started having the idea, okay, we now came up with an idea, concept, like uh, um, chapters of what the book was going to be about. But eventually, um, I now lose it because somebody else told me to work on the book to make it into a proper um, story. But I mean, it, was, it wasn't easy in the, in the beginning, yeah. but eventually I was able to flesh out the various ideas and dig into my past and figure out what happened and then try to um, write them down. Wow, and I also noticed today, today being the uh, 5th of June, you actually tweeted something. I mean, it was a post mm -hmm. on your story yeah. and you decided that you wanted to write the book. And two years down the line, I think this is the time that the book is coming out. Or how did you gather the tits and bits? You didn't just wake up one morning. Yeah, and so, have it so all just, just like so, it was about two years ago where Stephen Akatea interviewed me for the book. So okay. um, that was really the plan, you know, for him to help me out at that time. But unfortunately, we couldn't complete it for various factors. Mm. So I took a break. And I think it was um, late last year that I then restarted. I got somebody to help me put things in proper perspective. And then, we were able to get the book done. I must admit, see the first three chapters, I told you I read it twice <laughs> because it really, really gave me an insight on your childhood, your background, yeah. and uh, we'll get into that. I don't want to spoil the book for you guys. So um, I would like to know, Mom, see, uh, what do you, who do you plan to inspire after reading this book? What do I plan to gain? Like? So the critical objective of this book is to allow people, every reader, okay. must read and not see me as just somebody who woke up yesterday okay. and then began to host a TV show. Okay. Or um, became a known face. So people say, oh, you, you are fine. You people know you, you know these people, you are fine. Mm. It didn't happen that way. Mm. There was some work at the background. There were some mm. things I had done. There were some relationships I had to lose. Some mm -hmm. I had to gain. Um, some I had to nurture. You know, there were um, issues I've had in governance, in, in, in um, working in corporate Nigeria, working with friends, family, restrictions. So we've been through all those struggles. And those are the things that make up the person you see on television today. So you see me hosting the show, it looks like everything is perfect. No, it's not. I'm still a work in progress. So this book will let you know that I'm human. I'm just like you. And uh, if I can do it, you can, and you can do much more. And that, um, I'm, yeah, I'm the girl next door that has the same life experiences that many women do, do uh, across the world. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I remember the point where I read the book, I laughed, and I had to read that paragraph again. I mean, can you just give us a brief description of what really happened when you were in your church? Uh, was it a prayer meeting or a choir? Then your dad walked in. I <laughs> said, so you people are lying to this girl. Yes. Jesus is coming. Jesus yeah. is coming. He hasn't come, and he embarrassed you. How did you that, feel? Yeah, that was a long time ago. You know, I had so many memories in my past that I can't remember. Yes. So many memories are lost for life because yeah. of my accident. But yeah. a few come out. A few pop in here and there. Yeah. And that one in particular, you know, it was really shocking. I, I, I remember the forget that day. Um, he was in his solo with my dad, and he was he like next to our house was the church. My dad's house that, that was the church. And then I had given my life to Christ. I became a Christian. We're all Muslims now. So yeah. I was like the bad egg. Exactly. So it was having dinner, mm -hmm. you know. And usually it was Sunday night. Usually Sunday night we go back to my own house. So that was my second mom's yeah, house. Yeah, exactly. My second mom's house. Yes. And Sunday night we was supposed to go back to Ipako. So daddy was ready to go. Where's Mariel? <laughs> Where's Mariel? <laughs> so, you know, he church. Church, he gets. <laughs> eh? He was shocked. I just saw, I just knew I was there. I didn't even realize that. I just started hearing him, and he has a, a bit of a limp. He's going, you are lying to my daughter. Yeah. And he just crawled on that. My father has come and ran the way and rushed into the car. Between the, between the solo and Bagada, oh God, I got the preaching of my life. Do you know how many years you've been telling Jesus Christ is coming? Do you know how many years Jesus Christ has been coming? He has not come. He's not coming. He's not coming. You know, so it took a long time, but it was, it was an interesting um, time at the period. Thank God yeah. that he even became a Christian before he died. Oh, wow, that's interesting. I mean, and your background is very, 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 it's, I mean, it comes from your, your dad being a lawyer and an activist in Lagos and your, your mom being a big businesswoman in Lagos. So, um, you emphasize on the point where you didn't really have them around, like, sort of, you were sort of like leaning towards the, Additional cause where oh, 
Yes. Where are you? Yeah, so growing up, um, so, yeah, my, my neighbors, okay. the, the Mr. and Mrs. Adisha Kong, and they have three amazing young boys. They're like my brothers, Jiri Tunde and Tayo. And they were like my life because they were the only siblings I knew at the time, you know. My, my, other, my, my, my other sister and brother were in Isolo, so I see them only on weekends, you know. But every single day, these were the people that I, I saw after school. After school, I'm in their house. I have dinner in their house sometimes. Uh, sometimes we go out to a great club for weekends. I follow their mom to go and visit friends. It was there I learned family structure. It was there I knew mommy, daddy, children. It was there I saw how you can organize a home. And she comes back home in the evening. She she back back weekends. She would um, fry, she would cook her stew, stew to be very, very dry. Oh. And she now bag it, you know, little, little, little details like a child sees. Oh. And you realize, okay, these are little things you pick up on the way. So I learned a good, a good part of the values and stuff I learned came from Mrs. Adisha Kong. So she was a really good part of me. It wasn't my mother wasn't there. My mother too was very good, but she was a businesswoman. Yeah. She was constantly in Lagos trying to make ends meet because from exactly. the family, things always happen where you have to face your children. So she was at the point where she was just happy to raise her kids and get as much money as possible. So I came about 12 years after my, my, my the oldest brother. So I came at the time where she was hustling. She wasn't oh. there to in here. So did you get it from? I was just, um, so it was pretty much, usually when she, when she goes off, I'm always in the other children's house. And that's the day where the one that really helped me to get a lot of values and understand there's a family different than polygamy family. There's polygamous family, what I was used to. Mm. I was able to see a proper family structure, which is different, and that's what made you desire that wherever I marry you, I was not complimenting being polygamous. <laughs> <laughs> right, and but notwithstanding, you emphasize in this very good book, your relationship with your mom, which something very, very important that the uh, audience is to know. Your yeah. mom and you share the same birthday. Like, yes. How how does that happen? I'm sure you don't have friends that have that. <laughs> it's very, I mean, it was, it's, a, it's a bizarre story and I always shared it all my life. So my mother, as I said, she gave birth to me 12 years after her last child. So she actually yeah. was done. And um, the circumstances of how I got conceived is in the book. You find out that, you find that out when you, when you write the book. But um, what was interesting was that she was pregnant, she was due in July. And, you know, she was she doesn't have a CS. I mean, at the time she had not, never had a CS before. And doctor, the same doctor that gave birth to me was when I gave birth to my own first child. Wow. Doctor, oh, I just lost the doctor. Ah, I can't remember, I can't remember, I can't remember his name. But he uh, was... You should with, get it in the, in the book. I don't think I mentioned it, but, <laughs> but yeah, so he delivered me and then he, he tried to... So he saw that my her birth was on July 6th. Oh. So I think while she was in labor, maybe he made sure she pushed it to the next day, July 6th. I don't know what happened, but... She just woke up and they told her happy birthday and they gave her me. And it's, well, it's and a natural, it's a natural phenomenon. Yes. So for, for him to be that precise, yes. even if it's with his intentions, <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah, it's it a miracle. Was, it was. And so she dressed me up, she dolled me up in fact. Wow. I didn't know much about it, but people told me she said, I'm you had this sport little girl. Mama, she dressed like Cinderella, she buys me the best clothes, the shoes, I had the ribbons, everything was complete. I had gold that my mother dolled me up. I mean, I was that, I was that girl, she just had to just fall silly. She did, I know she did. <laughs> That's good to know. So, what plans, like, do you have for this book? Because I feel this book should have, like, a, uh, a reference to how far you've come. Mm. And each reader should not be judgmental from what they see on television. Right. You should just take it like a normal person right. going through normal circumstances. Exactly and against all odds, yes. still made it out and still became a person of yeah. record in right. society. So at, there's a point where those two paradigm shifts that I wanted to talk about okay. in your life. Yes. Now we can only talk about one now. Okay. The second one, you can find it in the book. Okay. That accident. Yes. I, I tried to envision how ghastly it was. Yeah. And the right word came from the book. It was something like a blockbuster movie. Yeah. Can you just try to be descriptive enough without being <laughs> no, on I mean, because, it's I mean, in the it's book, but it's okay. I mean, yeah. I don't mind because as I said, I want everybody to be to inspire. So yeah. um, I, it was, um, I was in the US and um, that, that fateful day, I was my, my, my boyfriend at the time, his name was Maurice. We were driving to um, New York. I was I live in Jersey. From Jersey. From Jersey. Okay. So we were driving on Route One to New York, and my, my dad was going to, to Nigeria. So I was going to go and see him off. And then we never made it because there was a Jeep Wrangler, you know, and it flipped. And then I, I, he lost. Now, according to his testimony, 
He said, I pulled the steering. But the police said that was the most, most that, that didn't make any sense because he was just trying to get his junior by his insurance would have to pay, pay the claims that he wanted to make it by force. But what happened was that the car flipped, he lost control. The car flipped and we then hung on the tree. It was quite painful. He fell off, unfortunately, but he fell off. But I was the one left on the jeep driver as he crushed on the tree. So, of course, 911 people called that an accident just occurred. Ambulances came, ambulances came and said, uh uh, you can't get her. No ladder can get this person, neither the chopper. So they called in the helicopter from Rutgers University Social Hospital, and they were the ones that came and got me out of that um, crash. And then I was, in the, I was in the helicopter, they lost me twice, and they had to revive me because of all things that reports in the medical report that we got. And then I landed on the hospital, I was in coma. Um, I lost between here, I still have a hole here, and the hole here, I lost six inches of my, of my, of my right thigh. My hip between on my hip all the way, they have to throw in a, um, a 12 inch rod all the way. I have two screws here, I have two screws in my ankle. I had a skull fracture from here all the way to the middle of my head. I had, um, I had a piercing here, I have a piercing here. I have what else do I have? I have you know, scars all over my body, just wow. as, as evidence. And I thank God for those scars because, as I said, anytime you know, I, I anytime I'm, I'm down and I see those scars, it reminds me that listen, God saved your life for a reason. The reason why you're alive because it, there's, there's so much work for you to, to do. So I'm not easily deterred by society, I'm not easily deterred by anybody around me. I focus because that man, that God saved that life for a reason. Um, and after coma, a few days after I was in coma, um, I came out and then I had to start therapy, you know, I had to speech therapy, walking therapy, I had to, um, I had to rejog, rejog my memory. Yeah, the right. doctor told me that. I would never remember anything before one week before and one week after the accident that's gone. And there'll be pockets on my past that you know I would I may lose, but eventually after many years it's a comeback as I progress. So and many memories have come back. Some I still don't remember, but um it took a while for the healing the healing took I was on wheelchair when I was discharged and I had to go back to school like a few a few days after. So I was wheeled, I used to wheel myself to the bus stop and then wheel myself and thank God I was um president of the student government um, in my school at the time. So because of that, I had enough contacts. So the director got me somebody who picked me up on the bus stop and then he got my schedule of my class and he moved me to my classes. You know, they did that for a while, for a whole term. Eventually, I then moved on to using my boots. After boots, I started using crutches. If I never started walking, I mean, doctors were not sure it was ever going to, ever going to work because I, if you crush me, you move a lot of your bone. I'm not sure you can walk, but let us just hope so I have a bit of a limb, but my right leg is about about an inch and a half shorter than my left leg. So, but nobody really sees it because I'm kind of used to, used to walking. So it was a huge period in my life where even this whole place was black. And I remember there was a time where I was crying to God. My face was black. I gained a lot of weight. I had to shave off my head because I couldn't use. I couldn't. My head, my head was. My skull, I had a skull fracture all this my head. Up. You had to shave. So I had to shave off the whole head. So for, for like a year in school, I was wearing a turban and wigs, and I was you know, then wigs was not very popular. I felt really awkward because I was telling me and everything. But I remember that day I, used to, I was crying at the altar. I said, God, if you can just even get rid of this black mark mm. on my face, eh, I will serve. You know, you just say, Father Lord, my face. Like, because I'm a young girl, I can't have this big thing on my face, you know? And honestly, I cannot say this is the day when his car went. I was just, many years were just passing. And God just totally cleared it away. And I thank God, even now, the sky is there, which is a good reference, but the mark is gone. And I thank God for the healing. Wow, uh, it's, uh, it seems that you've been always trying to impact change. Yeah. Like you've been a person of change because you mentioned now that in, while in school, in overseas, you were part of the student union. Yes. Do you see yourself like, I mean, I'm not trying to yeah. uh, give you an answer, but I mean, what are the areas that you feel you can impact change directly apart from this media because? I think media is a very strong tool. I really think that one of the most powerful platforms anybody can have is the media. Okay. And I don't think there's anything or any position that you can attain to that you don't need the media. So okay. um, I feel very comfortable in the media. Um, I feel that even um, it's still part of governance, you know, being able to articulate what the government is doing, being able to uh, convey what people are feeling to the government is a huge responsibility. So I don't take it lightly. So I wouldn't be. I'm not looking anywhere else. I'm looking, I'm staying focused in my own terrain and, and seeing how best I can maximize to achieve 
the assignment God has given me to be that conduit, that person that able to bridge the gap between, the, between those who are governed and who are governing us. Exactly. I, I, feel, I feel you're the best person to do this, not just because we're having this interview, but because I can just see that passion in you whenever you talk, even on your show or off camera. Yeah. Off camera. So, I mean, let's go into uh, the we have. I've been seeing your Instagram. I've yeah. been doing a lot of yeah. uh, snooping around lately, and it, there's a kind of theme yeah. that you have with your page, right. and it's looking very, very nice. It's yeah. so yeah. traditional. Yeah. It's it makes us embrace our heritage. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it deliberate. I mean, what's the idea behind it? Honestly, it's my mom, because my mm. mom is someone I wished she was alive. You look, I know it's your I mom and the way you look. My mother was alive now. Now that I'm doing this book, now that I'm oh. doing... Because she left me so much. And honestly, she had a lot of clothes. She was a fashionista. Okay. Now, during her life, I never used to like fashion. In fact, mm -hmm. I probably still don't. She used to beg me to wear clothes. She would beg me to come and take Ankara, come and take this, beg me to wear... I like, oh, I beg, I beg, I beg, I beg. And she used to give out a lot of her clothes to all her nieces, her boobos that come to her. She would give it out. And she always worried that this is my only daughter. Doesn't care about any of this. She would, she would go, she would go, she would come and take something. I won't answer her. But after she passed on, yeah. I feel like subconsciously I'm trying to make up for all the fact that I never collected her clothes. So I took up all her clothes and I said, Mario, you're going to wear these clothes. And not only are you going to wear them, you're going to showcase them. It wasn't my husband's not idea. When I was looking for what to wear for the events, ah, mommy has clothes now. Let me use her mommy's clothes. That's so true. I have all these clothes. Let me showcase my mother's fashion, the clothes she had. So maybe hopefully she'll forgive me for not wearing them while she was alive. Because I just felt it was a way of connecting with her and making her part of this entire book launch. I wanted her to. So that's why I wanted it to be go and big because I knew my mother loves all oh. So that was part of the thing. You know, that we, they need for the thing. Okay, so the book launch, you, you let yes. the cat out of the bag. Uh, first things first, this book, um, hopefully on the event, very soon, the next few weeks, uh, we'll have an event. I'll try to get as many people to come in to support the book because I hope to also give a portion of this to uh, an organization that supports university students especially. I've been part of their project for a while where they support especially indigent students who need help. So some of the proceeds from the launch will go to them. Um, I also have plans to start a mentorship program after the launch where I am mentoring about 50 young people over the year um, for different things, uh, most especially um, guiding, especially in, in, in their marriages. And I've seen that the first five years, a lot of young people have issues understanding the spouses. So I want to start that initiative where I'm supporting young marriages, especially young, young women, uh, to guide them on the various steps I took and how I was able to overcome those early initial challenges and to take them to where I am today. Um, also, I plan to do a book tour across the country to various places to talk about the book. So definitely is my first project. Uh, I've not started thinking of the next one yet, but let me just find a way to get this out as much as possible. And as I said earlier, my objective is to let every reader know that I'm just a girl next door. I'm just a regular girl who wanted to solve a problem when I'm using the media. And um, I went out to get women who are just like me, who had an opinion, who are different from me though. Different in perspective, they expression different in, the, in their own way of thinking. And we both get together in agreement and we're on the show together. And today, they were all the success on this time here. Wow, that's incredible. I mean, so we are looking forward to the launch. Is it this month or the next month? Is it June? Is it, is it June? June? I'm, being, I'm keeping the day, the day exactly very close to my heart because <laughs> I don't just want to rush me on that day. But um, in the next few weeks, uh, I'm not going to be so long. And uh, uh, it's here in Lagos. It's going to be um, the best people coming together and going to support the Muraya Afolabi Brown brand, you know, because I've just been a host of TV for so long, but now I'm launching my brand as a person. I plan to do so much more going forward. Um, I always people always ask me to come and speak at the, speak at events. I like the idea of speaking at events actually, but I shy away from it. The reason why I shy away from it is because I always feel that I'm not ready because I really want to cook myself in a lot of experience. And when I'm coming out, I'm speaking from from a place of power, a place of of real experience. So I always shy away from speaking, but now that I'm launching my brand. I'm telling the world that yes, I am ready. I have seen experiences, I have heard their stories, I have shared, heard, cried, um, I have um, rejoiced. I've had so many of those experiences that I am ready to share. And that's what this launch specifically is about.